Being a Polish Jew in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century didn't really have too many upsides. The Jewish community there regularly faced pogroms and other forms of anti-Semitism. So many of them thought they'd try out their luck in the so-called land of opportunity. Among these people was 8-year-old Meyer Lansky and his family, arriving in New York in 1911. Growing up in Lower East Manhattan at the time wasn't exactly ideal. You had two square miles crowded with immigrants, mostly Irish, Italians and Jews. Young Meyer did fairly well in school and was said to be good with numbers. However, like most kids from his neighborhood, he didn't really aim at an academic career in life. The roots of Lansky's future ties with the world of gambling may be found in a story he used to tell of how he was given a nickel by his mother, the night before the Jewish Sabbath, to pay a baker for the use of the heat. On his way, Lansky saw a couple of kids playing a game of craps on the sidewalk. He put in his nickel and, of course, immediately lost it. There was to be no war meal the following day and the whole family knew that it was his fault. Lansky felt like a fool and vowed never to gamble again. Although he did kinda like the idea of taking other suckers money instead. On the streets of New York City, Meyer made several acquaintances who would later become a sort of underground celebrities. Among these was Charles Lucky Luciano, who back then ran a gang of Sicilian immigrant boys which extorted money from Jewish kids. Legend says that the short and frail looking Meyer stood up to the Sicilians, upon which he and Lucky almost instantly took a liking to each other. Meyer frequently organized backroom craps games and as his reputation grew, he and a couple of his guys were often hired by local unions to beat up the men who worked in factories during strikes. Another of Meyer's later famous acquaintances was a Jewish boy by the name of Bugsy Siegel, who Meyer befriended when helping him escape from the police. Soon after Lansky and Bugsy met came the Prohibition, pretty much the golden era of organized crime in the United States. Lansky told Bugsy that there was a need for them to organize in the same manner as the Irish and the Italians, so they formed the famous Bugs and Meyer mob. The Bugs and Meyer gang was involved in several different criminal activities, including bootlegging, gambling and contract murders. The most notable of these contract murders was the killing of an Italian capo di tutti capi. Since the faces of Lansky's Jewish hitmen were unknown by most of the Italians, they were the most suitable option for carrying out the hit. They pretended to be taxmen and were led in the building where they disarmed the boss's men, entered his office and shot and stabbed him to death. The assassination quickly propelled Meyer's friend Lucky to power as the leading figure of New York's five crime families. By this time, the two had developed even closer ties as they were both key figures in the forming of the National Crime Syndicate in 1934. Once the prohibition had ended, Meyer Lansky wanted to focus on what he knew best, running gambling operations. He knew all the games and odds very well and had protection from the mob. What more do you really need? Well, actually, you need a good reputation. Since gambling was widely legal back then, most casino owners used rigged devices and cheated their visitors. Lansky was different. He always insisted on fair, honest gaming, which he considered was good for business. A few casinos in Saratoga Springs were soon followed by a couple in Hallandale, Florida. Meyer always believed that a bribe is a much better way to get things done than violence and intimidation. So he practiced giving $35 a week to every family in Hallandale just to tolerate the casinos and stay away. Imagine being able to buy a car after a couple of months of just living somewhere. As the years went on, the illegal gambling business in the US started gaining attention. Lansky was indicted and gained a criminal record. He worried that the authorities would get on his tail and decided to turn to Cuba, where Batista, the Cuban dictator, had offered him and the mafia control over the Cuban casinos and racetracks as long as they invested large enough sums of money. Lansky considered this a huge opportunity. A full-scale meeting of American underworld leaders was held in 1946 in Havana at which a few Jewish and most Italian top mobsters were present, including Lucky Luciano, Meyer Lansky and of course Joe Bananas. Here Lansky managed to sell them the idea of an ideal Cuban touristic haven where fat Americans could come to gamble, have fun with prostitutes and find every drug they could possibly want. Everything was agreed on and Lansky went back on his own vow never to gamble, investing a huge sum in Cuban casinos, even building one of his own. During his time there, Lansky and Batista were close associates and Batista seemed to be particularly fond of him. This was hardly a surprise since every time the two met, Lansky would give him a briefcase full of cash. Even though he was enjoying himself and earning enormous amounts of money, Lansky's days in Cuba were numbered thanks to the revolutionaries. 
After a civil war, Batista was defeated and fled, while Fidel gained power over the country. This was to be the end of the Mafia's involvement in Cuba, as well as a massive financial loss for Lansky. Gambling was soon banned, the dirty mobsters expelled, and Myers' nearly entire fortune taken by the new government. One can hardly blame the revolutionaries for getting rid of the regime and the Mafia. Even John F. Kennedy later said that there is no country in the world where economic colonization, humiliation and exploitation were worse than in Cuba. Following the revolution, Lansky returned to the States where he became closely watched by the FBI. They tapped his phones and formed a team whose sole purpose was to gather evidence on him, who they believed was the chief financial officer of a colossal underground network. But this was extremely hard to prove because Lansky looked like he was, well, retired. The most interesting thing they saw him do was walk his dog and occasionally wave to the press. However, Lansky felt that the constant digging of the feds would pay off and decided to seek asylum in Israel. By the law of return, every Jew seeking an Israeli citizenship would be granted one. But this wouldn't be the case for Lansky. After two years of US pressure, the Israeli Supreme Court ruled that Lansky was not welcome. Upon his deportation back to America, Lansky was accused of tax evasion and skimming casino profits, but was acquitted of both due to an unreliable witness and deteriorating health. Outliving most of his friends and associates, Lansky died of lung cancer in Miami Beach in 1983. Some say he died with just a couple of thousand to his name. Others say he had more than 300 million hidden in Swiss offshore bank accounts. Some say he was the mob's accountant, while others say he was for a time the leading figure in organized crime. Who knows? One thing is for certain though, whether good, bad, moral or immoral, Meyer Lansky, a short Polish Jew from the Lower East Side, achieved what he set out to do. Please like and share if you enjoyed this video and don't forget to subscribe. See you next week!